How you going, people? That's a pretty good little video on a, a shooting. Not that it's a good shooting, but uh, I think the cops pretty much didn't have a choice on this one. So uh, if you want to go watch the original video without me talking, don't cry in the comments. Uh, here's the name of it. Body cam officer, fatal shooting suspect, clerk, Las Vegas. There's the date. It's on Video Leak Police. Make sure you subscribe and like all these channels that are promoting holding cops and government accountable. Uh, without these guys putting this stuff out here, nobody would know what's going on, which is exactly what government would love. So I'm sure they're going to find a way to stop it soon. But I digress. Here we go. Let's see what's happening here. As we know them today, ref 10.30 a.m., a shooting occurred in the 3300 block of Brussels. It was reported that several shots were fired into a vehicle. Fortunately, no one was injured in this event. An individual identified as Maurice Parker. Maurice Parker. Now, they interviewed his mom. This guy was just getting, he just got accepted to doctor school, and he was about to leave before this incident. So, according to mom, this is an isolated incident, kind of like police brutality. Uh, was identified as a suspect in that shooting, and that was based on witness statements, surveillance video, as well as casings from that scene were matched with the firearm that Mr. Parker had on him when he was contacted by officers. Okay, so this is critical information that the officers knew at the time they contact him. But did they know the casings match, or did they know he was a suspect? That will go into the totality of circumstances on why, and to me, when I see four or five officers with shotguns and multiple officers approaching a guy in a store, they're pretty sure he's armed and dangerous, and they're pretty sure that he's probably going to fight. Now, for those that don't know why you could figure that out, I can look at this guy, and I'm just going to take a swinging wild-ass guess, my little swag here, that this guy, this is not his first brush with law enforcement. This guy's been to prison. He's been to jail. Rick, you can't judge something. See, that's ignorant liberal shit that'll get you killed if you're a cop and you run around thinking that you need to, you know, all rattlesnakes don't bite. You should go play with them and see which ones do before you judge them, Rick. All alligators don't eat people, Rick. You should pet them and see if they eat you before you judge them. Well, that's just idiotville, and that's how you get your ass killed, okay? I don't need somebody doing a two-week study uh, with a doctor's degree telling me that this guy is probably going to fight when the cops get him, okay? And he could be white. And I would be saying the same thing because there are certain indicators that you just learn over the years on when criminals are going to be criminals. But I digress. Here we go. I, I had to piss some people off because, Rick, you're judgmental and you shouldn't and you should love and hug and he just needs a hug. Okay, yeah, he just shot a bunch of people at drive-by shooting and he's going to pull a loaded gun on five cops with guns. And somehow some idiot's going to be running around, Black Lives Matter, he was going to doctor school because his mom said so. Whatever. Detectives learned that Mr. Parker was employed as a clerk at a convenience store located in, in the 2500 block of North Pecos. Sergeant now, we Perry, don't know how they learned this. Along with Detectives Pappas, McGill. But what we do know is that they did learn it. And if they, which they probably did do a search warrant on this guy's house. Normally when there's a shooting or a homicide, all cops, we follow up. We go do a search warrant to find either evidence of what caused the crime or what causes the contact, etc. So they probably went to where this guy lived after they found out, did a search warrant. In the search warrant, in the probable cause and affidavit, it would say, during the course of the investigation, we had three witnesses that identified Maurice, said he had a tattoo on the middle of his head of a cross. Uh, we identified him by his gang name of Paco Loco, whatever. And uh, he said that uh, uh, he ran and he fled in this type of car where ran a car, came back registered to him or his sister or whatever. So all those facts would be, he just said the detectives learned Okay, they learn, but we don't need to really know. When I talk about totality of circumstances, some people like to come here and be smart and go, well, Rick, how do they know? We don't know if they just cheated and they just... It doesn't matter how they knew. They knew it and they based their decisions on that information. It's for the courts later to determine whether or not the cops were reasonable in what they knew and how they acted. And Stafford drove to the store to arrest Mr. Parker for the shooting. As detectives approached the store, they immediately spotted Mr. Parker standing behind the cash register. Sergeant Perry, the rest of the detectives, 
and two patrol officers made entry into the store. So some people will say, well, how do they know it was Mr. Parker? How do they know it wasn't somebody that looked like them? Mr. Parker has a few distinct tattoos on his neck and, and forehead. That, and, and, and what I thought I saw a freaking, uh, what was the other thing he had? Like a little, uh, uh, what does that call? A piercing or something? Whatever. So Mr. Parker has some distinct, and usually guys get these tattoos on their face and neck to show who they are, to announce what they're about. Okay? You don't see too many uh, Second Amendment guys running around with the snake on their head and don't tread on me on their face. Okay? That, that's just not how they do things. Now, when you go to prison, you get tattoos in order to show your loyalty, etc. Rick, not everybody has tattoos in prison. I know. Quit crying. You little tattoo criers come here. He's picking old people with tattoos. I'm not. Just using common damn sense. The shooting. As detectives approached the store, they immediately spotted Mr. Parker standing behind the cash register. Sergeant Perry. At least Mr. Parker had a job. Now, me personally, with my skewed, biased, judgmental attitude, he got that job so he could rip them off and figure out the routine on how they saved the money, and he was going to rip them off later. Rick, you can't do that. Just because he had a gun and shot people and pulled a gun on cops, he was a good guy. Okay, yeah, you're an idiot. The rest of the detectives and two patrol officers made entry into the store and gave Mr. Parker verbal commands to keep his hands in the air on the back of his head and to not move. Okay, so let's take a look at these commands. So this kind of happens fast, and you see a guy outside with a gun through the window, which he's too damn close. He's got he's probably getting close because he can't see. He should be standing up with a good two-handed stance, so if he shoots, the glass isn't going to hit him in the eye. The closer you are to glass when you shoot, the more likelihood it's going to shatter. This isn't a car windshield, so it's going to kind of explode. But anyway, I digress. Uh, we got a guy on the ground here. I don't know what else I saw before I stopped this. Let's see here. In the air, on the back of his head, and to not move. So we have one, two... That looks, oh, that's his legs. So we have three inside and one outside. Okay, so the guy holds his hands up, feigning, faking, acting like, hey man, I'm just trying to get into doctor school. Ask my mom. Everything's cool. Don't shoot. I'm good. Hands up. Don't shoot. I can't breathe. All the things we've been told that everybody that gets shot was suddenly just being a great person. Okay. Do not move. Put the hands on top of your head. Yes, sir. Turn around slowly. Do not move. Do not go on your knees. Stand up straight. Now, I checked his waistline when he turned when I first saw this, and I'm looking for a gun. And his shirt's loose, and you notice he's leaning forward. You notice he's looking down and leaning forward. He's trying to cover up any kinks he knows that if he stands up straight, you're going to see the gun in his waistband or pocket. Now, this may not be the case in this incident, but when career criminals carry guns, they learn how to conceal them. I can't tell you the number of people that have taken off with weapons, and I noticed before we, while we were giving them commands or dealing with them, they were either protecting, covering, bladed stance, keeping the side away with the gun, bending over, keeping their leg or, or their hand in an awkward position, standing with their leg or hips twisted. You can tell a lot by body language when somebody's trying to conceal something. If you're looking, other people would say, look, man, he's putting his hands behind his head. His hands are up. They just shot him because he's black. Yeah, well, that's because you're an idiot. Turn around slowly. Do not move. Notice the bending over. Why is he bending over? Why isn't he standing up straight? Does anyone else find that odd? He's almost standing up straight here, but you notice his front shirt never goes tight. It always hangs loosely to cover his waistband area. Turn around slowly. Do not move. Do not go on your knees. Stand up straight. He doesn't want to stand up straight because you'll see the gun. Do not move. Now, if any officer saw a gun here, normally you want to identify Bulge on the right side. Looks like he's got a gun in his right pocket. He's, I think he's armed. He's got a gun. There's a bulge. It looks like a gun. You would articulate this to everybody so everybody knows. Even the suspect knows. Whoa, dude. We know you have a gun. Our guns are out. Don't fuck around. If you go for that gun or make any move to that gun, 
you're going to die in the dark if you blink. So I'm telling you, don't freaking screw around with this. So this guy's giving some pretty good commands of this guy, being very, very clear. One person's talking. They're all not yelling and screaming. So there's no way somebody's going to say, well, he was confused. Doctor school wasn't this hard. Whatever. Interlock your fingers. Stand up straight. That's all I got so now we've set up a pretty good crossfire. Obviously, we already had a crossfire. So we have a guy outside. I think that's still the cop here. We have a guy here, and now we have a second guy here, and we got a guy here. This is what, what, what I call tunnel vision when we see a threat, and cops do it all the time. It's hard to not do it. The more you've been around, the more you've done it, the more you're more worried about getting shot by another cop, and you're not so focused on the suspect making an arrest or getting him, and you start thinking, wait a minute. I know I've freaking cops work. There's a bunch of cops here. Not only do I have to watch him, I got a bunch of cops with guns, and I don't want to get in front of them because they don't may not be thinking that I'm in front of them before they shoot. So this is what I call rookie moves or just tunnel vision. These guys want to get on this guy quick, and they start moving around, circling the wagons, and they create a really dangerous crossfire. Okay, so we have one, two, three. Maybe this cop from outside came in. Because I don't see him outside anymore. This guy's got a pretty little yellow Glock. Rick, it's not a yellow Glock. That's a taser. I know you freaking crybabies. Just had to say it so one of you guys can come here and comment. He doesn't even know what a yellow Glock is. Don't stop here, right? Okay, so this guy's got his, his gun pointed down. Uh, and he's kind of follically challenged. I don't understand the purpose of this, people. If this guy is a threat and other people have their gun, this guy's got a shotgun. And that's why I think this guy drops so quick. He gets shot with the shotgun. This guy's taking a lowered stance. I'm not sure why he's low. Maybe he's using the counter for cover. But if this guy drops down, this guy has no shot whatsoever. So he's lower. This guy can still get a shot if he drops down. And this guy's got his gun holding down like, I don't want to I don't want to point my gun at you guys. I know everybody else got the gun. I'm the nice guy here. I, I, I don't understand this gun down thing, but okay. Keep your hands on top of your head. So this guy doesn't have a mask. This guy's got... Did his hands just come off his head? I thought he just said keep his hands on his head. Ricky didn't understand. In doctor school, putting your hands on your heads means taking them off. Oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> Notice he goes right for the center that he keeps bending over and he's concealed. And he looks at his target glance to look at which target he's going to shoot. Now, who thinks your odds of outdrawing... I mean, this guy's watched too many freaking westerns. Who thinks you're going to be able to get your gun out with four cops, a shotgun, and they got their guns out, and they're ready to shoot, and you're surrounded. And somehow you think, with your doctor school mind that you're going to be faster than them and you're going to draw a gun and be able to shoot all of them before they shoot you. Who thinks that's reasonable? Well, when you're dealing with unreasonable people, they don't act reasonable. That's why when you give cops shit for doing things that to you seem unreasonable, a lot of times we're working from the standpoint we're dealing with unreasonable people that do unreasonable things. And if you deal with them reasonably, you end up on the losing end of a gunfight. This guy got second place in this drop gunfight. I still can't see the bulge. I've been looking at his waistline the whole time. I don't know what gun he had. I think they might tell you. You'll see that they uh, make contact with him. He initially complies. Initially complies. How many times does that happen? Everybody initially complies. When you use the term initially complies, I call that the suspect was planning his next move and suckering us in to get our get cops to drop their guard so he can get an advantage of surprise. He wasn't complying. He was suckering these guys in, waiting for his opportunity and planning on his next move to escape. And then he'll quickly reach into his waistband, lifting his shirt, to pull out his firearm as he turns towards the officers.
Damn, those are some good looking bananas. I'm surprised the fire department ain't there. Like blocking off traffic. There's a banana in the crime scene. Let's get a fire truck out. We need a ladder truck over here. We got to do something to justify our job so we can get paid to sit around and sleep and eat the firehouse. Man, this guy's got yellow gloves on or what? He's got yellow gloves and a yellow. Maybe he was designated non-lethal and couldn't have a real gun or something. What the hell is all these freaking bright? Anyway, I'll digress. Here he goes. He's reaching. Nope. And the hand's coming. Oh, man, that was fast. Well, that didn't take long, did it? Even in slow-mo. Doesn't take long. This is a slowed-down version uh, of that fisheye camera. Fisheye? Wow. Looks like he has the gun in his hand, That's maybe? The firearm that he was reaching for. So he did have the gun. He got, he was able to get his hand on the gun, but he didn't get the clear leather. Now, raise your hand if you think these cops should have waited to see the gun, waited to see if he was really going to point it. Maybe he was reaching to drop the gun. Maybe he was going to give up, Rick. Maybe if and butts and coconuts, everybody's a freaking idiot. And now we have dead cops instead of a, a dead bad guy. Yeah, okay. Raise your hand if that's what you think. Freaking liberals. Mr. Parker initially complied and placed his hands on his head and faced away from the officers as he was instructed. As Sergeant Perry continued to issue, ver issue verbal commands, Mr. Parker reached into his waistband. So when this shotgun goes, the fight's kind of over, dude. And this guy is so tense, I don't even see him budge. I mean, watch the flash and watch this guy doesn't move. That's what happens when you're tense. Call it white knuckling. We used to train for white knuckling when we shoot. White knuckle that grip. White knuckle it. Squeeze it as tight as you can. Your knuckle should be turning white. And that's to reinforce that when you're jacked up and in fight or flight and you're really in an actual shooting, that's probably what's going to happen. So if you train that way, it not only steadies your grip, not only it reduces recoil, but it gets you in a mind frame of probably what's going to happen in an actual situation. This guy barely moves. There's the, there's that. Look at the guy. Do you see him move? So, bang. Barely freaking moves on that shotgun. And produced a handgun and turned toward the officers. Simultaneously, Sergeant Perry... Detective Pappas, Detective McGill, and Detective Stafford fired their weapons, striking Mr. Parker. Basically, everybody with a damn gun in their hand fired, which I think is probably a good deal. Now, most people fired one or two rounds. There's one dude that fired eight rounds. Now, remember the Supreme Court rule, the number of rounds fired by the cops does not mean they're trying to kill the guy. It merely means how fearful and how dangerous they thought the situation was and how they perceived the threat was real. This guy's a real threat. He shot and killed people. And he's reaching for a gun. So I got no problem with these guys firing multiple rounds and uh, humanely dispatching the uh, future doctor that will never be. Officers immediately summon medical personnel, but Mr. Parker succumbed to his injuries at the scene. Oh, shit. Eight rounds from one dude. Everyone else fired one or two. And he was hit with a shotgun. And probably it was either a double lot buck or a slug. I'm thinking it was probably double lot buck which is nine 32 caliber pellets leaving the barrel at about 13 to 1400 feet per second. That is a, at this range, probably all nine pellets hit. Now, the velocity was knocked down because of the glass that went through, but not enough to make a difference. For that firearm uh, that was later recovered uh, nearby. So he never even got out of the holster. But that's a nice holster, man. What is that, like alligator? Damn, man, those doctors make a lot of money. Uh, inside the store, and that's the firearm that was in the holster. The officers that were involved in this OIS are assigned to the Investigative Services Division, Gang Crimes Bureau. They work in plainclothes capacity, and as such, they do not wear body-worn cameras. The officers uh, were wearing tactical vests with insignias that clearly identified them as police, and we do have body-worn camera from the patrol officers who were on scene. The officer-involved shooting occurred in the 2500 block north Our Sergeant Stephen Perry. Sergeant Perry is 52 years old. He's been with LVMPD since 1999. 
In this incident, Sergeant Perry was armed with a Glock 17 9 mm equipped with a tactical light. The investigation revealed that Sergeant Perry fired one round. So one round. I'm okay with that. Bang. He dropped. He dropped pretty damn quick because he got hit with multiple rounds at the same time. And because he, he probably bled out, I mean, you know, a shotgun has 932 caliber pellets. Then you have three guys with nine mils. Then you have another guy that shot eight times. This guy, was his body probably went into shock and trauma that pretty much just shut down is why he went down so fast. Second officer involved is Detective Eric Stafford, S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D. Detective Stafford is 35 years old. He's been with Las Vegas Metro since 2008. In this incident, uh, Detective Stafford was armed with a Remington 870 12-gauge shotgun. It was equipped with a tactical light, and the investigation revealed that Detective Stafford fired one round. The third detective involved... He didn't say what kind of round it was. I'm assuming it's double op buck. That's the standard load we carry. I carried uh, my second round, I think, was a slug because I figured the first round would be, oh, shit. And then my second round was a slug. And then I carried a couple other double op buck. And I think my last round was a slug. So I kind of uh, varied my loading of my shotgun. Uh, some guys do it. Some guys just load it straight with double op. Called is Detective Julian Pappas, P-A-P-P-A-S. Detective Pappas is 31 years old, and he's been with Las Vegas Metro since 2014. In this incident, Detective Pappas was armed with a Glock 19 9mm. The investigation revealed, revealed that he fired eight rounds. So he fired eight, the other guy fired one, and then the shotgun fired one. Lastly is Detective Solon McGill, S-O-L-O-N, McGill, M-C-G-I-L-L. -L. Detective McGill is 41 years old, and he's been with Las Vegas Metro since 2013. In this incident, uh, Detective McGill was armed with a Wilson Combat 1911. That's a freaking high-priced gun. Man, those guns are usually two, three, four grand each. Carrying that on duty? Woo, 1911? Damn. 45 caliber handgun. The investigation revealed that he fired three rounds during this incident. So three 45 casings, eight 9 mils, another 9 mil, and a shotgun with 932 caliber pellets. This guy went down fast. And that's why. And probably not too many people missed at the distance they were at. Yeah. The suspect was identified as Maurice Parker. Parker's 34 years of age. He's a black male, 6'1", 235 pounds. As I mentioned before, he was also the suspect who was identified in the shooting that occurred earlier that morning. Mr. Parker was armed with... Now, he slid that in, that he was identified. That could have been a little bit of the after investigation. But see, he gets to say... He didn't say the officers knew for a fact and all that, which really doesn't matter. I mean, the guy went for a gun. They, they, they were going to arrest him. They had probable cause. Cops were good. They were where they were supposed to be. They gave him every opportunity to give up. I know Black Lives Matter is going to be protesting and burning and destroying, saying he had his hands up. Don't shoot. All right. With a Taurus G2C 40 caliber handgun, it was loaded with 10 rounds in the magazine. Well, he had a 40 caliber. Most of the cops had a little 9 mil. Rick, a 9 mil's a good bullet. I'm going to stop watching you because you don't like my gun. All right, whatever. Mr. Parker's charges, had he survived, would have been shooting into an occupied structure, conspiracy to discharge a gun within a vehicle or prohibited area, prohibited person in possession of a firearm. Prohibited person in possession of a firearm. That means he's a convicted felon. That means he can't have a firearm. Well, Rick, how'd he get one? Rick, we need more gun laws. We need more training so people know all the gun laws so they won't carry guns. Yeah, that's because you're an idiot. Resisting an officer with a deadly weapon. An assault with a deadly weapon on a public officer. I'll take any questions. Okay, the questions are pretty stupid. Uh, anyway, look, good shooting. I don't have a problem with this. Uh, cops tried. One, two, three. Everybody shot. I don't know who had the... I would guess the guy with the Wilson Combat 1911 is an old-timer. Most, most young guys aren't really 1911 guys. So uh, I don't remember if he said the age of the guy with the 1911, the Wilson Combat, but... Those guns, I think if you want to buy a Wilson Combat 1911, there's a waiting list of like two years for the backlog. you got to order it and wait two years just to get it. And that's before this crisis. I don't know what it is now, but even now it probably is about the same because a lot of people just don't spend three, four grand on a pistol. And uh, But they, they are pretty nice. I mean, um, I, I, I've, I like them and, you know, anybody that has them. Now, now Wilson Combat is mainly become a they stopped making guns so much and they started a part business so anybody that owns a 1911 will usually use wilson combat parts and they make really good parts they're a little bit more expensive than other parts but they're more finely tuned and usually if you want to make your 1911 better you buy a cheap 1911 for four or five hundred bucks 
you want to make it good, you want to put some Wilson Combat parts in it, and uh, you can tune it up and make it a lot nicer, and you don't have to spend three grand on a Wilson Combat. But uh, I think Night Nighthawk is another brand, uh, or Night something. I think it's Nighthawk. Those were guys that used to work at Wilson Combat, and they left and decided to make their own guns because Wilson got away from guns and went into parts. So a Nighthawk is kind of considered almost right up there with a Wilson, but Wilson has the name and, and the longevity for being around for a while. But anyway, that's some 1911 gun shit. Most 1911s are 45. You can get them in 9 mil, but if you're going to carry a 1911, 45s away. Those 345 rounds probably did more damage than all the other rounds combined. Rick, you can't say that. That's... All right, whatever. All right, we'll end that there. Y'all have a good one.